allocate their time, energy, and money efficiently in ways conducive to building, health, to building wealth. Efficiency is one of the most important components of wealth accumulation. Simply, people who become wealthy allocate their time, energy, and money in ways consistent with enhancing their net worth. Although both prodigious accumulators and under accumulators of wealth state similar goals without achieving wealth, these groups have completely different orientations when it comes to how much time they actually spend on wealth building activities. PAWs allocate nearly twice the number of hours per month to planning their financial investments as UAWs do. There is a strong positive correlation between investment planning and wealth accumulation. UAWs spend less time than PAWs consulting with professional investment advisors, searching for quality accountants, attorneys, and investment counselors, and attending investment planning seminars. PAWs on average spend less time worrying about their economic well-being. We have determined that under accumulators are much more concerned than prodigious accumulators with the prospects of not being wealthy enough to retire in comfort, never accumulating significant wealth. Are their concerns realistic? Yes. Yet UAWs spend more time worrying about these issues than taking proactive steps to change their tendencies to overconsume and underinvest. What type of person recently indicated that he was afraid and worried about the following two issues? Number one, experiencing a significant reduction in his standard of living. Number two, not having an income high enough to satisfy his family's purchasing habits. Who is this person? Perhaps he is a mail carrier with two children in college, or perhaps he is a single, low-income parent who has to raise three children. Do you envision a middle-aged corporate manager who recently found out that his position would be eliminated? Certainly, these are logistical guesses. People in these categories would very likely express fear about having to reduce their standard of living and not having the income to satisfy their family's buying habits. But none of these people is the one we are, taught, we are about to profile. The respondent who actually expressed these fears and worries is a surgeon in his 50s whom we shall call Dr. South. See Table 3.1. He is married and has four children. Why should he be worried about his standard of living and his income? Could it be that he's down on his luck, perhaps unable to continue to practice medicine because of disability? No. Actually, he is a fine physician who earned more than $700,000 during the, the year prior to our interview with him. But in spite of his high income, his net worth in real terms is declining. He has reasons to be afraid and worried. Dr. North is very similar to Dr. South in age, income, and family composition. But Dr. North is a PAW. His profile is also detailed later in this chapter. Dr. North has far fewer worries than Dr. South. He is not afraid of being forced to reduce his standard of living. Unlike Dr. South, he is not concerned that his income will not be high enough to satisfy his family's purchasing habits. This is especially interesting given that both Dr. South and Dr. North have similar incomes. The case studies that follow will introduce you to these physicians and their families. You will learn a lot about how each man makes use of his time, energy, and money. But before we profile these two physicians in detail, we will discuss the income and wealth accumulating habits of physicians in general. Doctors, PAWs, and UAWs. On average, physicians earn more than four times the income of the average American household, 140,000 versus 33,000. But Dr. South and Dr. North are hardly average physicians. They are gifted and highly trained specialists. In fact, the average annual income for someone in their specialty is more than $300,000. But again, they are extraordinary even among their cohorts. Last year, uh, they each earned more than $700,000. In spite of his income, Dr. South has a relatively small level of accumulated wealth. He spends a lot, invests little. Our research has found that physicians in general do not tend to be wealth accumulators. In fact, among all major high income producing occupations, physicians have a significantly low propensity to accumulate substantial wealth. For every one doctor in the PAW group, 
there are two in the UAW category. Why are doctors lagging behind on the wealth scale? There are several reasons. Foremost among them is the correlation between wealth and education. This relationship may surprise some people. For all high income earners, those earning at least 100,000 annually, the relationship between education and wealth accumulation is negative. High income PAWs are significantly less likely than UAWs to hold graduate degrees, law degrees, or medical degrees. Millionaires type typically indicate on our survey business owners with some college, four-year college graduate, or no college. Warning, parents should not suggest that their children drop out of college and start a business. Most businesses fail within a few years of their conception. Only a small minority of business owners ever earn a six-figure income, but those who do tend to accumulate more wealth than others in the same income cohort. The some college, four-year college graduate, and no college types who have high incomes often had a head start on many well-educated workers. Doctors and, and other well-educated professionals get a very late start on the earnings race. It is difficult to accumulate wealth when one is in school. The longer one stays in school, the longer one postpones producing an income and building wealth. Most experts on wealth agree that the earlier one starts investing one's income, the greater the opportunity to accumulate wealth. Mr. Denzi, for example, is a business owner with two years of technical school training in data processing. He started working and building wealth at the age of 22. Today, 30 years later, he has benefited greatly from the meteoric increase in the value of his pension plan. In sharp contrast, consider the situation of Dr. Dokes, who graduated from high school the same year as Dr. Denzi. Dr. Dokes opened his private medical practice more than a dozen years after his classmate, Mr. Denzi, started a business. During that 12-year period, Dr. Dokes spent his time studying and spending his savings, his parents' money, and money he borrowed for tuition and living expenses. During the same time, Dr. Denzi, who designated himself as not college material, focused his resources on building his business and becoming financially independent. Who is the UAW category today? Is it the not college material business owner, Mr. Denzi, or the valedictorian of his high school class, Dr. Dokes? The answer is obvious. Mr. Denzi is a prototypical PAW while Dr. Dokes is a UAW. Interestingly, both earned approximately the same income last year, nearly 160,000, but, but Mr. Denzi has five to six times the wealth of his high school classmate, and he has no debt. Mr. Denzi can teach us all something about accumulating wealth. Begin earning and investing early in your adult life. That will enable you to outpace the wealth accumulation levels of even the so-called gifted kids from your high school class. Remember, wealth is blind. It cares not if patrons are well-educated. So the authors have an excuse. How else does one explain why two experts on wealth are not wealthy? In part, because they spend a combined total of nearly 20 years pursuing higher education. Another reason very well-educated people tend to lag behind on the wealth scale has to do with the status ascribed to them by, by society. Doctors, as well as others with advanced degrees, are expected to play their parts. Mr. Denzi is a small business owner. In spite of being wealthy, he is not expected by society to live in an exclusive neighborhood. He would not be he, he would not be out of place living in a modest home or driving a nondescript sedan. His domestic overhead is significantly lower than Dr. Doak's. Many people tell us that you can judge a book by its cover, meaning that high-grade doctors, lawyers, accountants, and so on are expected to live in expensive homes. They also are expected to dress and drive in a style congruent with their ability uh, to perform their professional duties. How do you judge the professionals you patronize? Too many people judge them by display factors. Extra points are given to those who wear expensive clothes, drive luxury automobiles, and live in exclusive neighborhoods. They assume a professional is likely to be mediocre or even incompetent if he lives in a modest home and drives a three-year-old Ford Crown Victoria. Very, very few people judge the quality of the professionals they use by the net worth criteria. 
many professionals have told us that they must look successful to convince their customers, clients that they are. Of course, there are exceptions, but people who spend many years in college, professional school or graduate school are more likely to have higher levels of household overhead than less educated people. As a rule, doctors have exceptionally high levels of domestic overhead. The concern in many of these households is with consuming, not investing. Physicians often find that they are at disadvantages in, in living in affluent neighborhoods. People who live in expensive areas are often bombarded with solicitations from cold calling investment experts. Many of these callers assume that people in upscale areas have money to invest. In reality, many people who live in luxury have little money left over after funding their high consumption lifestyles. Some naive cold callers purchase prospect lists that fit two criteria. First, prospects must be physicians. Second, they must live in exclusive neighborhoods. It's no wonder physicians are the favorite targets of some of America's most aggressive sellers of investment ideas. Too often, doctors who receive such solicitation assume that the callers are just as professional as physicians. Many physicians have told us that they have had bad experiences with investing via cold callers. In fact, many have been burned so badly that they never again invested in the stock market. This is unfortunate given the overall growth in the real value of the equity market. And in rejecting the stock market, they figured that that left them with more money than for spending. The, this attitude is not as rare as one might think. A plastic surgeon added that he had three boats and five cars but hadn't gotten around to assembling a pension plan. Financial investments didn't have those either. Speaking of his colleagues, the surgeon said, I don't know even one guy who hasn't been beaten to death in the financial markets. As a result, they don't have anything. At least I'm going to enjoy spending my money. Later on, this doctor summed up his financial philosophy. Money, he said with a wave of his hand, is the most easily renewable resource. What other factors explain why so many doctors are members of the UAW group? Our research shows that they are generally unselfish. On average, they contribute a higher percentage of their incomes to noble causes than do other high income producers. Also, doctors are among the least likely to receive inheritances from their parents. Their less educated brothers and sisters are significantly more likely to inherit money. In some cases, physicians are asked by their elderly parents to help out less fortunate brothers and sisters after parents are no longer able to help pay their bills. These findings are detailed in Chapter 6. Doctors often allocate large amounts of their time to serving patients. They rarely work fewer than 10 hours a day thus expending most of their time, energy, and intellect on patients. In so doing, they tend to neglect their economic well-being. Some doctors figure that working hard translates into a large income and that, therefore, there is no need to design a household budget. Some ask why they should waste time planning a domestic budget and investments when there is so much income to be made. Many high-income producing UAWs feel this, feel this way. PAWs tend to have just the opposite feeling. To them, money is a resource that should never be squandered. They know that planning, budgeting, and being frugal are essential parts of building wealth, even for very high income producers. Even high income producers must live below their means if they intend to become financially independent. And if you are not financially independent, you will spend an increasingly amount of your time and energy worrying about your socioeconomic future. Planning and controlling. Planning and controlling consumption are key factors underlying wealth accumulation. Thus, one, would, one should expect that PAWs, like Dr. North, take the time to plan their budgets. They do. Conversely, Dr. South has no control over his family's consumption other than his household's income limit. We asked doctors South and North about their respective planning and controlling systems. Does your household operate on a fairly well thought out annual budget? No. Dr. North? Yes, absolutely. Operating a household without a budget is akin to operating a business without a plan, without goals, and without direction. 
The Norths have a budget that calls for them to invest at least one-third of their pre-tax household income each year. In fact, during the year that we interviewed Dr. North, he and his wife invested nearly 40% of their annual pre-tax income. How were they able to do this? In short, they consume at the same level as the average family that earns about one-third as much as they do. What about the Souths? They consume at the same level as the average household that earns nearly two times more than they do. In fact, their hyper use of credit is more in line with that of households that earn several million dollars each year. The Souths essentially spend all their all or more than their income each year. Their this income is their only this income is their only restraint. We asked both doctors another set of questions. Number one, do you know how much your family spends each year on food, clothing, and shelter? Number two, do you spend a lot of time planning your future, your financial future? Number three, are you frugal? You probably predicted the outcome. Dr. South responded with three no's, while Dr. North responded with, in true PA fashion, with three yeses. Consider the frugal orientation of Dr. North. He stated emphatically that, for instance, that he never bought a suit that was not offered at a discount or a special price. This is not to suggest that Dr. North is poorly dressed, nor does he wear cheap suits. Rather, he purchases quality clothing, but not at full price and never on impulse. This behavior was part of his socialization process as a youth. When I was going to school, my, my wife taught. We had, we had a small income. Even then, we always had a rule to save. Even then, we saved. You can't invest without something. The first thing is to save. Even when I was 11 years old, I saved my first $50 from working in a grocery store. It's just like today. Only today, the number of zeros changed. More zeros, but it's the same rule, same discipline. You must take advantage of investment opportunities. You have to have something to take advantage of excellent opportunities. It's part of my background. Dr. South reported having just the opposite orientation. How much did he and his family spend on clothing during the year prior to, the, to our interview? About $30,000. Thus, the South spend nearly as much on clothing each year as the average household earns in total. That is $33,000. The consumption habits of the Norse versus the Souths. The home team. The most high income households consist of traditional married couples with children. Both the South and the North households are traditional. We determined long ago that the habits of both husband and wife account for variations in accumulation wealth. Your spouse's orientation toward thrift, consumption, and investment is a significant factor in understanding your household's position on the wealth scale. Who is the tightwad in your household? In the case of Dr. North's family, both he and his wife fit the profile. Both live well below their means. Both contribute to planning their well-thought-out annual budget. Neither objects to buying used motor vehicles. Both can tell you how much their family spends each year for a variety of products and services. Neither objected to sending their children to public elementary and high schools. Both place a high priority on being financially independent. Yet, these goals never translated into shortchanging their three children. The parents funded their children's college educations as well as their graduate school and law school tuition and fees. They also provided them with funds to purchase homes for, rel for rel related expend expenditures. The Norris paid for these expenditures out of investments that they'd set aside for their children. Conversely, the Souths are not investors. Almost all such allocations in the Souths South household come from current er earned income. What if your household generates even a moderately high income and both of you and your spouse are frugal? You have the foundation for becoming maintaining for becoming and maintaining PA status. On the other hand, it is very difficult for a married couple to accumulate wealth if one, if one is a spendthrift. A household divided in its financial orientation is, is unlikely to accumulate significant wealth. Even worse are cases in which both a wife and her husband are spendthrifts. This is the domestic situation the Souths find themselves in today. Interestingly, Dr. South reported to us 
that he is a tightwad in his household. Is he? True, he takes aim at the shopping and consumption habits of his spouse, but spending all or even most of their annual income takes a team effort. Both are hyper-consumers. Both contribute to their lower-than-expected position on the wealth scale. Let's evaluate Dr. South's wealth-building performance. He is responsible for his household's income, and there is no argument that he is an extraordinary in this regard. His performance places him in the 99.5% percentile of all income earners in America, but he is also responsible in part for making other decisions for his household. He buys the motor vehicles and, and financial advice. He also makes investment decisions, but neither he nor his wife does any budgeting for, their, for the family. Dr. South is responsible for buying the family's clothing. In one year, he spent about $30,000 on clothing for herself and her family. She also contributed significantly to the decision to spend more than $40,000 for country club fees and related expenses. Both decided to spend $107,000 per year in mortgage payments. Most UAWs will tell you that their big mortgage helps reduce their taxable income. Of course, if the Souths keep saving money this way, they, they may never be able to retire. Often people who purchase expensive homes and automobiles are criticized by their ex, for their extravagant lifestyles, but at least homes in most cases hold their value, if only in a nominal sense. Even automobiles hold some value for a few years after they are purchased. Large allocations for homes and automobiles can have a dampening effect on wealth building. But again, at least you can trade up, out, or down with such items. There are worse culprits. How much is the South's $30,000 clothing purchase that they made last year worth today? How much will their $7,000 vacation they recently took be worth tomorrow? How much value is there in remaining from the more than $40,000 they spent last year for country club expenses? Add to these gourmet restaurant patronage, maid services, tutors, lawn care, landscaping services, decorating consultants, insurance, and more. The South's consumption habits are related to the fact that they have no centralized control over their expenditures. Much of their consumption is a function of independent action in this household drama. This is not the case in the North household. Dr. North and his wife both play active roles in budgeting and spending. They plan together and consult with each other regarding expenditures. We will deta detail their system, but first let us examine the South situation. Mrs. South is responsible for purchasing a wide variety of products and services for her household. She did not consult with anyone before spending $30,000 for clothing last year. She does, she does her thing and her husband does his. She has her set of credit cards and he has his. Mrs. South is particularly ardent patron of upscale department stores. These include Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, and Lord & Taylor. She carries credit cards for each of these stores. In addition, she and her husband hold a MasterCard and a Visa card. Dr. South ha also has the American Express Platinum card. What's the problem? Often Dr. and Mrs. South have little or no idea what their counterpart is buying or how much each is spending. This is especially true for soft goods and intangibles, such as clothes, gifts, and entertaining. Both are susceptible to solicitations from everyone from store clerks to financial advisors, from automobile sales per personnel to credit officers at banks. If you, were, if you were one of these people, who would you call? Who would you keep abreast of new products and service offerings? Who would you advise about a special showing of the latest fashions and motor vehicles. Why does Mrs. South spend so much money? In classic UAW fashion, her husband has encouraged her to do so. He was the product of a high income producing indulgent set of parents. He in turn has given his wife almost a blank check when it comes to shopping. And of course, the Souths associate with other hyper consumers. But there is something she and her husband don't know. They are unique. They are not typical consumers. No one ever told them that most people in their income bracket, including the Norse, never spend money like the Souths do. Unfortunately, the Souths never learned about the prodigious accumulators of wealth. The Norse are very different from the Souths in their spending behavior. Both Dr. and Mrs. North come from backgrounds of frugality and thrift. 
throughout their marriage, they have communicated with each other about resource allocations. Their budgeting system is basic to their controlled consumption lifestyle. Unlike the Souths, the Norths own no credit cards for upscale department stores. That's right. The North family, whose net worth is more than 18 times that of the Souths, hold no cards for Neiman Marcus or for Saks Fifth Avenue or from Lord & Taylor. They are only special occasion shoppers at such stores. Almost all their household purchases are placed on one central credit card, a Visa card. Both their purchases are listed in one single statement each month. Each month, they determine how much remains uh, to be allocated for each consumption category. And at the end of the, each year, they refer to these statements to compute their total expenditures for each category. Using this, st this statement facilitates budgeting and making appropriations for the following year. Most important, their planning. Budgeting and consumers consuming are coordinated events. Unlike the Souths, the Norse have one joint checking account to help facilitate their budgeting of items not paid for with their credit card. What if you want to budget but don't like the process? We recently interviewed a CPA who offers a household budgeting and consumption planning service. Mr. Arthur Gifford, who has several hundred high income producing clients, most are either self-employed professionals or business owners. Some are PAWs, some are UAWs. We asked Mr. Gifford who uses his budgeting and consumption planning system. His response was predictable in light of the case studies of the Souths and Norris. Only those clients with considerable wealth want to know exactly how much their family spends on each and every category. Mr. Gifford is correct, but aren't PAWs usually price sensitive when it comes to purchasing services? Not always. They are much less price sensitive when buying services that will help them control their family's consumption behavior. Do you know exactly how much your family spent last year for each and every category of product and service? Without such knowledge, it's difficult to control your spending. If you can't control your spending, you're unlikely to accumulate prodigious amounts of wealth. A good start is to keep an accurate record of each and every expenditure that your family makes each month or ask your accountant to help you set up a system for tabulating and categorizing these expenditures. Then work with, e with her to develop a budget. The goal is to enable you to set aside for investing purposes at least 15% of your pre-tax income each year. By the way, this 15% method is Mr. Gifford's simple strategy for becoming affluent.